Now it is time for the last word with my friend Ali Velshi in for Lawrence. Good evening, Ali. An excellent show it was, my friend. Nice to see you and have yourself an excellent weekend. You too. Thanks, Alex. Men at some time are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. If you're a lover of Shakespeare, that passage from Act One of Julius Caesar might be on your mind right now, because this week we saw MAGA faithful Republicans make the latest Trump pilgrimage, showing their fealty at the trial of a man accused of making hush money payments to the former porn star Stormy Daniels to stop her from going public with their alleged affair during the 2016 election. And we saw these Republicans, indoctrinated by Trump, do this not once, not even twice, but three times. Three times, Monday, Tuesday, and yesterday, three different groups of the Red Tie Brigade, most of them members of the legislative branch of our federal government, skipped out on their day jobs to do Donald Trump's bidding and attack this nation's criminal justice system. We've never seen anything like this. And while this performative display of devotion to Trump is a lot of things, unethical, anti-democratic, demoralizing, and just really cringy. It's also, and this isn't exactly a journalistic way of describing something, it's also weird as hell. It's just phenomenally bizarre. Imagine trying to explain what's happening right now, this week, to yourself from 10 years ago. Remember 2014, before Donald Trump came down that wretched escalator and began his one-man mission of destroying seemingly every norm he possibly could in American politics? Imagine telling that version of yourself from 10 years ago that the guy from the You're Fired reality show has rendered the Republican Party into a bunch of servile sycophants willing to attack the criminal justice system for a guy on criminal trial in a cover-up scandal involving a porn star. The Party of Lincoln, they call it. The Law and Order Party. And these are members of Congress making this Trump trek, including the Speaker of the House of Representatives, people elected by voters like you and me, people whose salaries are paid for with our taxes, yours and mine. These obsequious lackeys are playing hooky from their day jobs to parade before reporters at the behest of their dear leader who has conditioned them into this madness. This is the boiling frog experiment on steroids. Imagine if you told your boss you were going to miss tomorrow's appointment or shift or team meeting because you had a friend who's not really a friend on trial for something like this. The missing MAGA lawmakers did not go unnoticed on Capitol Hill this week, by the way. That was especially true in Republican-led House committee hearings where those Republicans doing Donald Trump's bidding are attacking his campaign rival, President Biden, and his attorney general, Merrick Garland. Well, it's nice to see that some of my colleagues on, this, on the other side can make it today. I, I don't know if that means that there weren't enough seats in the courtroom in New York. Uh, but I know that the Oversight Committee canceled the hearing that was supposed to happen right now on this matter so that they could uh, be uh, at the president's trial. I know some members will miss this vote uh, because uh, they want to be at the president's trial. And I don't think that anything could animate the phrase, do nothing Congress more than missing votes and canceling hearings to go up and be a spectator at your cult leader's trial. That is the definition of do nothing Congress. Now, these hearings are investigations themselves in search of a crime. Late last night, when that aforementioned oversight committee meeting did finally happen, Republicans started even more chaos. Do you know what we're here for? You know we're here about oh, just AG. To, uh, I don't think you know what you're here President. for. Well, you the one talking about, I guess. I, I think your fake eyelashes are messing up. No, what you're ain't nothing. Hold on, hold on. Listen. <laughs> Order, Mr. Chairman. That's beneath would even you order, 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 order of your committee. Order. I do have a point of order, and I would like uh, to move to, to take down Ms. Green's words. That is absolutely okay. unacceptable. How dare you uh, 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 attack the physical spend. appearance of another spend. person? Are your move feelings hurt? Her words down. Aww. Oh, oh, girl, baby girl. Oh, really? Don't even play. I'm just curious, just to better understand your ruling. If someone on this committee then 
starts talking about somebody's bleach blonde, bad built, butch body, that would not be engaging in personalities, correct? A uh, uh, what now? Chairman, I'm I, make a, I make a motion to strike those I, words. I don't, I don't think that's Hold a on. part I'm of it. trying to find clarification on what quality. Chairman, I, I motion to I strike no those words. I what you just said. We're not gonna. We're not gonna do this. Look, you guys. Earlier, literally just. Oh. You just. Oh, you just first. voted to do oh, it. First, so you you just voted, voted to do it. Okay, that's what got all the attention. What didn't get the attention it deserved are moments like this from Congresswoman Crockett, who'll join us in a moment. This idea of lacking all decorum, decency, has left the building when the stench of Donald Trump showed up. Um, and so we've seen constantly from him how he mocks people. We've seen in this committee how different members want to mock other members. And that's all this is about. If this was so important as it relates to whether or not the president of the United States has done something so wrong, then why is it that we couldn't have our hearing at 11 o'clock this morning instead of members being in a criminal courthouse with a twice impeached, over 88 count indicted, sexual abuser, instead of being here to do the work of the American people, if this was serious. It wasn't just Democrats calling out the trial-bound caravan of Republicans groveling to Trump. Earlier this week, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski told Huffington Post, quote, do we have something to do around here other than watch a stupid porn trial? I mean, this is ridiculous. Now, it's a fair question, because the answer is yes. Members of Congress do have a lot more things to do, except that's not what Republicans do anymore. They don't work with Democrats to find common ground and pass laws to make life better for Americans like you and me. Like those frogs in the boiling pot, Trump has conditioned them, broken norm by broken norm, to spread the American carnage that he talked about in his very first moments as president on his inauguration day. The number of Republicans who remain unwilling to bend the knee is growing smaller and smaller. This week of insanity was capped off with the New York Times reporting yet another Trump-induced controversy for the Supreme Court. Quote, after the 2020 presidential election, as some Trump supporters falsely claimed that President Biden had stolen the office, many of them displayed a startling symbol outside their homes, on their cars, and in online posts. An upside-down American flag. One of the homes flying an inverted flag during that time was the residence of Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito in Alexandria, Virginia, according to photographs and interviews with neighbors, end quote. We're going to have more on that story later this hour. But first, we begin our conversation tonight with the Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, Democrat of Texas. And as we mentioned, a member of the House Oversight Committee. She's also a civil rights and a criminal defense attorney whom we've known for some time. We knew her when she was in the in the Texas legislature. And uh, a, an observer back then would have realized that one may pick a fight with you, Congresswoman Crockett, but one has to expect one is going to get a fight back. <laughs> Absolutely. It's great to see you. And thank you so much for showing that I actually was trying to engage in something of substance in the committee hearing as well, um, because unfortunately, the drama is the only thing that anyone knows about what happened yesterday. But when we talk about whether or not Republicans are serious about doing the work of the people, um, you have to juxtapose the fact that the Speaker of the House specifically disinvited the president of Kenya for a joint address to Congress, because he said, we're just too busy, we have too many things to do. And then these mm -hmm. people don't even show up for work. And instead, by the time they come in, all they do is wreak chaos and havoc. Let's talk about this concept of, of even that, that oversight uh, hearing, the things that are getting discussed. Uh, as we described it, it, it's an investigation in, in search of a crime. There's an actual crime uh, or that's, being, that's being tried in a court, but this Congress seems uh, fixated on doing things about and around Donald Trump. At some point, when you go back to your district in Texas, people must be telling you this can't be what they expect Congress to be doing. No, 
No, absolutely not. Um, you know, my district wants me to work on real issues, such as my constituent, Eugene Gates, who worked for the Postal Service and died um, under terrible working conditions. They want us to investigate that. They want us to come up with things to make sure that we can save lives. Um, but this particular committee has decided because they've engaged in failure after failure after failure, that now we want to point to A.G. Garland. And because we weren't able to get the Homeland Security um, Secretary and because we weren't able to get the president, now let's decide we're going to go after the attorney general and instead say, you know what, hold him in contempt. They talked about jailing him, another thing that wasn't highlighted, but they talked about throw him in jail. Now, they want to throw him in jail. Imagine this, Ali. They want to throw him in jail because they say, well, we didn't get the audio recordings of the voluntary statement that was given by the president of the United States. We have the transcript, and you heard Comer say last night, I've got two hearing aids. I can't hear. So why he needs the audio, I'm still kind of confused. But nevertheless, they want yeah. to throw him in jail for that, yet they want to go and defend Trump for something so much more egregious and act like he should not be in jail at all. That's who these people are. But isn't, isn't that the, 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 the problem? Because at one point, Mike Johnson had said this about impeachments. He said, you know, once you start going down this road, everybody just does it to everybody. Is this not the point, though, that they are distracting from Donald Trump's uh, alleged criminality by turning what are policy issues. If you don't like what the Homeland Security uh, Secretary is doing, that's a policy issue. You vote the bums out and you get a new Homeland Security. If you don't like what the Attorney General is doing, it's the same thing. They are they are turning policy disputes into uh, into something that is meant to look like criminality. Absolutely, because they want to make it seem as if everyone is on the same level as Trump. And the reality is that Trump is in the basement. Um, the rest of us are residing above the basement. And we, you know, you think about this, Ali, what are we dealing with right now with the Supreme Court? We are dealing with lawyers that are saying, you know what, he needs to have a pass to commit crimes while he's president. And the Supreme Court is actually listening and weighing in on this as if it's anything to think about. This is what we've devolved in. This is why this is not the party of law and order. This is why we saw all of the chaos yesterday with Marjorie Taylor Greene. This is why we saw chaos last week with Marjorie Taylor Greene. So there is no there, there, and both sides are equally bad. There, that is not the truth. The reality is that once Marjorie broke the rules yesterday, Comer decided he wasn't going to enforce the rules, and I decided that I didn't sign up to come to Congress to be anybody's doormat, and so, therefore, I was not going to violate the rules. But because I understand the rules and I'm a good lawyer, I decided to just ask a, parliament, a parliamentary inquiry. I want to ask you, by the way, talking about law and order, I want to talk about your, your state of uh, Texas, because an interesting thing happened, and if people haven't been following the story, um, it, 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 what the governor of Texas is saying is not actually what happened. Uh, a man named Daniel Perry was found guilty by a Travis County jury last year of shoo shooting and murdering Garrett Foster. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Um, governor Abbott said at the time that if the Board of Pardons and Paroles would pardon uh, him, he would uh, he would pardon Perry. And that's exactly what happened. It, it, Daniel Perry shot a man. Uh, the man had a gun, as he was licensed to have in, uh, in Texas. He was not aiming it at anybody. He was not using it in any uh, threatening ma manner. And your governor in Texas claims that this is a stand-your-ground case. <laughs> yeah, he just decided to usurp an entire jury. I mean, it's disrespectful to the judicial system yet again. This is what we see. It's a matter of when they talk about a two-tier justice system, this is what we see. Because you had a white officer that ended up killing a black man, and because he was supposedly associated with Black Lives Matter, the governor feels as if you can go out and kill them. There was more outrage when we started talking about Christy Nome and her killing a dog than what we get when people kill actual people. And yes, black folk in this country are people as as well. And this is what we get when we decide, oh, well, you know what? I'm not a racist, but I'm going to vote for him because I like his tax policies. Well, let me tell you, you are supporting racism when you allow these types of people to go ahead and ascend to the highest levels of power. And let me tell you, the real two-tier justice system is the one that says that this guy gets out of jail for taking a life while this other guy is not even facing 
three of the four indictments that are pending against him as he is currently trying to ascend to the most uh, powerful position that we have in this country and ultimately potentially wreak the same level of havoc, because we know that he was also letting his criminal friends out of prison when he had the power as well. And he said he will do so uh, again if uh, if uh, he gets the presidency again. Jasmine Crockett, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time, as always. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett Absolutely. of Texas. Coming up, this week has confirmed beyond doubt that most Republicans have not only accepted, but are actively embracing Donald Trump's attack on the rule of law and on the criminal justice system. It's a scary escalation when combined with as the congresswoman was just saying, Donald Trump asking the Supreme Court for immunity for any and all crimes he may have committed as president. Stuart Stevens joins us next. Another effect of Donald Trump's American carnage seeping into so many aspects of our life is that he says increasingly crazy and incendiary stuff, and no one even pays attention to it. Take this example. This past Saturday, during a rally in New Jersey, he memorialized someone who, A, is not a real person, B, is a serial killer, and C, is a cannibal. The late, great Hannibal Lecter is a wonderful man. He oftentimes would have a friend for dinner. I'm about to have a friend for dinner, but Hannibal Lecter, congratulations, the late, great Hannibal Lecter. Now, if any other political candidate ever had said something like that, you'd never, I mean, never hear the end of it. Trump has blown a fuse in American politics. Our existing ways of understanding politics cannot adequately make sense of how something that bonkers comes out of the mouth of a major presidential candidate, and hundreds of people cheered and kept listening to him. Seems like it needs a psychiatrist, not a pundit, to analyze it. It's incomprehensible. And so the news moves on, because Donald Trump is also on trial in criminal court, also a new rock bottom for a former American president. This week, he complained outside the courtroom about the legal jeopardy that he has created for himself, saying things that are complete and total lies. Everyone's laughing at the New York system, and companies are leaving, people are leaving, but major companies with tremendous taxpayer dollars and employment, employers of Millions of people, literally, people are leaving. They're taking their companies and they're all watching this case. What the hell is he talking about? First and foremost, that's a blatant lie. It's also just a ridiculous thing to say. It reminds me of that moment in Austin Powers when Dr. Evil says this. My father would womanize, he would drink, he would make outrageous claims like he invented the question mark. Joining us now, Stuart Stevens, a veteran of five Republican presidential campaigns, senior advisor at the Lincoln Project, and a partner at Resolute Square, a pro-democracy media platform. He's the author of It Was All a Lie, How the Republican Party Became Donald Trump. I mean, obscure, Stuart, that you and I, uh, having talked for many years, would be on TV discussing a silly Austin Powers quote, except that's how ridiculous it is. The Hannibal Lecter stuff, the companies and people uh, leaving New York in droves. But he just says it, and I'm not entirely sure what we're supposed to do. What do you do when a, a presidential candidate and former president starts talking about Hannibal Lecter entirely out of context? Do you move on, or do you sit there and say, this is too crazy to comprehend? Look, I think there's two things that, uh, at work here. One is, there is a cognitive decline of Donald Trump. If you look at Donald Trump even eight years ago, he looks like a—it sounds like a very different person. He was mean. He was racist. He was uh, sexist. But he wasn't in the cognitive decline that he's in now. Um, this is a guy who is on a fast track to dementia. And we should talk about that, because it's extraordinarily dangerous if this guy becomes president of the United States. I mean, do you really want to give nuclear weapons to somebody who's up there talking in public about Hannibal Lecter as if he's a real person? I mean, it's just, it doesn't have anything to do with right or left or conservative or liberal. Right. This is just, a, you know, a, a, a man who's in decline, and he should never be president. 
But there is a right and a left, and there are people who have opinions, as they should, across the political spectrum. And I would think, but I've been an idiot because I've been thinking this for eight years. I would think this is a great time for some of those people to do what people like you have done and said, whatever my political beliefs are, wherever I lie on the ideological spectrum, it's not getting achieved with this guy. It's not, we're not furthering the debate in American politics with this guy. And yet they line up. They go to that courtroom. They have no business going there. If you never showed up at Donald Trump's trial, it wouldn't affect you politically. And yet they go. Yeah, you know, I, I miss Shane, Ali. I really do. Um, it, it was a useful instrument in civil society. Um, <laughs> yes. It, you know, this is why I called this book I wrote. It was all a lie. Because I don't know any other conclusion you can come to. You know, people don't abandon deeply held beliefs in a few years. And this party, this was the character counts party. You know, Peggy Noonan wrote a book when character was king. And they're up there voluntarily dressed like some sort of aging boy band reunion and, and talking about the president, the you know, guy that wants to be president of the United States who had you know, is accused of having sex with a porn star 10 days or so after his son, youngest son was born, who paid her off. I mean, it's just all so tawdry. You know, in 2000, uh, when I worked for Bush, uh, the single most powerful message that we had in that campaign was restoring honor and dignity to the White House. I mean, it, it, it worked better than anything else because it resonated with people. And, you know, I still think that America's out there. I think the Republican Party mm -hmm. is out of step with that America. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the reasons that Joe Biden is going to win resoundingly in the fall. I do think that America's out there. Uh, we'll leave it on that note. That's, uh, that's positive. Stephen uh, Stewart, good to see you as always. Thank you for joining us. Stuart Stevens. Coming up, we already knew that the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was at the Trump rally before the attack on the Capitol and was privately urging Mark Meadows to overturn the election results. Now the New York Times is reporting that days after the January 6th attack, an American flag was flown upside down at the home of Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito a symbol that was at the time being used as an indication of support for Donald Trump's attempt to overturn the election. And those two justices right now are considering whether to give Donald Trump immunity for the crimes he allegedly committed, including up to and on January 6th. That story's next. All right, tonight we now have to question the impartiality of not one, but two Supreme Court justices as it relates to cases before them involving the January 6th insurrection, including whether Donald Trump has absolute immunity from prosecution for trying to steal the 2020 election. The New York Times is reporting that for days following the January 6th attack at the Capitol, neighbors saw that the American flag displayed outside the home of the conservative Justice Samuel Alito had been turned upside down. Inverting the American flag has also been used by some Trump supporters, including at the Capitol, at the riot at the Capitol, who believe Trump's lies that the 2020 election was stolen. In an emailed statement to the New York Times, Samuel Alito said, quote, I had no involvement whatsoever in the flying of the flag. It was briefly placed by Mrs. Alito in response to a neighbor's use of objectionable and personally insulting language on yard signs, end quote. Today, Samuel Alito offered this justification to Fox Sunday host Shannon Bream, who posted, quote, he told me a neighbor on their street had an F Trump sign that was within 50 feet of where children await the school bus in January 21. Mrs. Alito brought this up with the neighbor. According to the Justice Alito, things es escalated and the neighbor put up a sign personally addressing Mrs. Alito and blaming her for the January 6th attacks. Justice Alito says he and his wife were walking in the neighborhood and there were words between Mrs. Alito and a male at the home with the sign. Alito says the man engaged in vulgar language. Following that exchange, Mrs. Alito was distraught and hung the flag upside down, end quote, a uh, quote, for a short time, end quote. Justice Alito says some neighbors on his street are, quote, very political, end quote, and acknowledges that it was a very heated time in January 2021. Now, let's consider what Samuel Alito did not say in any of those explanations. 
Reporter Edward Isaac DeVere points out that Samuel Alito, quote, does not explain why his wife's reaction to an F Trump sign and being insulted was to hang an American flag upside down in the days after January 6th, end quote. Michael Barbero, host of The Daily, goes even further, writing, quote, crucially, Alito doesn't deny the flag was flying upside down, doesn't deny its meaning, doesn't express any disapproval for it, and doesn't disavow it, end quote. And The New York Times reports that, quote, given the timing and the starkness of the symbol, neighbors interpreted the inverted flag as a political statement by the couple, end quote. So now we have not one, but two Supreme Court justices who appear to be at least openly in support of one political candidate. And neither Samuel Alito nor Clarence Thomas have recused themselves from cases currently being decided by this court, right now directly influencing how Donald Trump and other January 6th defendants can be prosecuted for their alleged crimes. The Democrats are calling on Samuel Alito to recuse himself immediately, including the Senate Judiciary Chairman Dick Durbin, who said, quote, flying an upside down American flag, a symbol of the so-called stop the steal movement, clearly creates the appearance of bias. Justice Alito should recuse himself immediately from cases related to the 2020 election and the January 6th insurrection, including the question of the former president's immunity in U.S. versus Donald Trump, which is the Supreme, which the Supreme Court is currently considering. The court is in an ethical crisis of its own making, and Justice Alito and the rest of the court should be doing everything in their power to regain public trust, end quote. Joining us now is the Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. He's a member of the House Judiciary Committee. He served as an impeachment manager in the second, Donald Tr second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. He's suing Donald Trump over the January 6th riot. Joyce Vance joins us as well. She's a former United States attorney and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. She's a co-host of the podcast Hashtag Sisters in Law, an MSNBC legal analyst, and a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law. Good evening to both of you. Thank you for uh, being with us. Congressman, let me start with you on the political side of this, because as I read this, and in fact, I had this conversation with my executive producer saying, I, I think we should just wait to see whether Alito has a reasonable explanation for this. Like, he always puts the flag upside down because he can never get the rights. You know, like, whatever. There might have been some reasonable explanation for this. And yet he offered an explanation. And at no point, as those reporters point, point out, did he say shouldn't have done that, didn't mean that to be a symbol of stop the steal. He, he, just, he just left it all hanging out there for us to understand that, yeah, actually, he hung an up, uh, upside-down American flag outside his house, or at least his wife did. Uh, Ali, Justice Alito's uh, excuse, and let's call it that, is an excuse, it's not a reason, uh, is as upside-down as the flag uh, that he and his wife flew outside their house. And, and by the way, uh, for Democrats, this is a uh, flashing warning sign for us that the Supreme Court matters. And if we don't tie the presidency as we go into this election, how we talk about it at debates, how we talk about it at the convention, how we talk about it to voters, uh, we are uh, going to pay the price uh, for decades for having extreme judges uh, on the bench. But one other point, and I'm sure Joyce uh, would make this point too as a practitioner, but uh, as a former prosecutor, I can tell you the most important attribute for any judge that presides over any case is judicial temperament. So even if you were to buy his excuse, what does it say about a justice that he and his wife are so easily baited by a disagreement on the block that their response would be to just completely throw out the window uh, any perception of independence uh, that he should have. That means to me that he certainly should not uh, be presiding over the most serious cases uh, you know, that come before uh, the court and, and certainly should not preside over any case that has to do with January 6th. So, Joyce, let's dig into this, because there are two very distinct points here. There, there's a point in the story that Justice Alito uh, gives to uh, uh, this, this reporter at Fox that I get, right? There was a fight. There were words exchanged. Uh, people, whether they're justices or, or, or uh, judges or, or lawyers or regular people, have a right to be miffed by something a neighbor might have said. How it got from there to an upside-down flag and what that is supposed to mean is one matter that I'd like you to talk about. And the second one is how we now deal with the fact that there is an actual case before Justice Alito and his colleagues having to do with Donald Trump and his behavior as it related to the election on January 6th. 
you know, this shouldn't be a difficult situation to deal with. If this was a Democratic Supreme Court justice who had done it, a Democratic appointee, I think we know what the answer would be. This is a situation that happens in the wake of January 6th. The inauguration of Joe Biden has not yet happened, and the upside-down flag has become a, a symbol of the Stop the Steal movement. So that's clearly the context in which this happens. And look, the flag is up for a couple of days. We don't know exactly how long. Justice Alito presumably drives in and out of his home during those days. You know, my husband was just a state court judge, but if one of our kids had done something like that, he would have immediately taken it down and reminded the kids that as a judge, he had an obligation to preserve an appearance of absolute neutrality and to live that, right? I mean, that is your obligation as a judge, to be a fair neutral. Well, it's an even higher obligation for a Supreme Court justice. And the problem is we have a Supreme Court that is not cabined by any formal ethics rules. It's up to each justice to decide what their own behavior should look like. So I think Congressman Swalwell is absolutely right when he says we have to put the Supreme Court on the ballot. This is something that the Republicans have done very successfully, especially conservative Republicans from the Federalist Society for decades. They've said you may not like who the nominee is, but the president appoints Supreme Court justices, and that's a very important policy. We need to, um, I, I think, see that that happens on both sides of the aisle. And if Democrats believe in these sorts of egalitarian principles, then they need to make sure that people in their party understand the impact of appointing Supreme Court justices. And Congressman, we do have agency and we do have the vote, and all of that uh, can be achieved if Americans understand what the stakes are. And of course, you combine that with all the other stakes that are out there, including reproductive freedoms uh, and, and the climate and the situation in the world around us. Uh, that should be obvious, except there's a lot of time between now and the election. And any one of these days, we are expecting to hear from that Supreme Court on this matter of Donald Trump's immunity. And neither Justice Alito nor Justice Thomas have shown any interest. In, in, in hearing the concerns and complaints of people who think that they may have been affected, uh, you know, by, by, by their spouse's involvement or, or their own views on this matter. And so I think we can do two things. One, that the public sentiment, uh, you know, should persist, and, and that is powerful. So your viewers have agency uh, as well to express, you know, their uh, outrage and belief that he and Thomas should recuse. But in the Congress, we should make it clear that in a Democratic majority, uh, when we achieve that in November, uh, that we will seek to put a code of ethics in place. And Leader Jeffries put out a statement today saying uh, that in the majority we will seek to do that. Ali, I have long resisted being a part of the effort to call for that. And maybe it's because I had some high-minded uh, concept that the Supreme Court would be able to police themselves. But Justice Thomas and Alito have shown that they can't. Even if Chief Justice Roberts you know, wants that to happen, and I, and I believe some of his genuine efforts to try and bring them to that, they're not going to do it unless Congress puts it into, into law and has penalties for any violations. Is that likely, Joyce? Is that, is, that, is that something that is likely to happen in our super polarized world? You know, it's a tough lift. There are also questions about whether it's constitutional, but I've regretfully come to the same conclusion. And when you think about it, these sorts of rules exist on a mandatory basis for all of the judges in the lower courts. The courts of appeals, the federal district court judges across the country are bound by ethical guidelines. And the problem here is that the Supreme Court justices have repeatedly proven that voluntary guidelines don't work. There has to be something more. It's, it's not a straight jump. You know, every judge isn't forced to recuse for an infraction, but there is this notion of accountability. And if judges and justices are asking all of us to be accountable under the law, then we should expect the same from them. Thank you to both of you. I appreciate your analysis tonight. Congressman Eric Swalwell and Joyce Vance, as always, thank you. Coming up, labor market is solid. Wages are up. The stock market is at record highs. Good news for many people's retirement and pension funds that are invested in the stock market. How does the Biden team talk about the positives while still hearing voters who are hearing from higher prices? Well, if anybody can explain, Robert Reich can, and he's going to join us next. Could be the first ever record close above 40,000, 10 seconds to the end of a wonderful trading week. 
It's news that even Fox can't deny. Stocks are soaring under President Biden. Today, for the first time in history, the Dow closed above 40,000. Fox alert for you. No problems at the corner of Wall and Broad. At the very last teeny second of trading, the Dow did move over 40,000, settling at around 40,000, 3.59, with a gain of about 140, uh, 134 points. All optimistic on the uh, stock front. Now, I've been an economics reporter since before the Dow crossed 10,000 for the first time, and I've never loved leaning too far into the stock market as the most important of economic measures. And as I've shared the view that presidents get too much blame and too much credit for the performance of the stock market, not everybody agrees with me, including and especially the former president of the United States. The stock market is, by a country mile, Donald Trump's absolute favorite metric. And this Biden-era bull market is breaking his brain a bit, as you see here. The Biden team can say, well, if things are so bad, how come the stock market's on a roll? Because they think I'm going to be elected. That you think the stock market's rallying because people think you're going to I be do, elected? I do, yeah. Joining us now, Robert Reich, former Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton. He's a smart guy. I'm just not sure he can even explain what Donald Trump was saying there. He's a professor of public policy at UC Berkeley and co-founder of Inequality Media, which is going to become relevant in this conversation, uh, Bob, because whenever we talk about the stock market, the question of inequality uh, does come up. But let's just talk about it for a moment. We have on mass, macro-wise, uh, we've got wages that are rising faster than inflation. We've got inflation that has cooled to some degree, a, a large degree, but not as much as the Fed would have liked it to. Um, we have strong GDP. We have a lot of people involved in the economy. Uh, we have under 4 percent unemployment. Um, talk to me about this stock market and how our viewers should be thinking about it tonight. Well, first of all, as you indicated, but let me just underscore, Ali, the stock market is not the economy, and inequality does play a big role in analyzing how important the stock market is. The richest 1% of Americans own about 52% of all of the shares of stock Americans own, uh, and the richest 10% of Americans own about 93% of all the shares of stock Americans own. So, uh, you know, if the stock market does very well, uh, that's great, but it's not helping most Americans. Okay, so good. Let's 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 uh, dispense of it then for a moment, because the the things that do help uh, Americans are jobs, wages, and affordability. Uh, if you are locked into a mortgage, you got a mortgage a few years ago at three percent or something like that for thirty years. You're, you're doing you're you're probably doing fine. If you're renting today in in major American cities, and that's a long term infrastructure problem on our part. Things are tough. Your, your inflation rate looks very different than, than mine does. Exactly. And high interest rates, Ali, are something that are not talked about very much in terms of lower income people and their effect on lower income people. But the fact of the matter is that it's not only mortgages and rents that higher income, uh, higher interest rates affect, uh, but also auto loans uh, and uh, all yep. the bank credit cards and credit card fees. And, uh, you know, a lot of lower income people are really being hurt badly by high interest rates. So, Bob, here's the problem. Uh, people want Joe Biden and his administration to go out and talk about the actual things that they're doing in the economy that are good for the long term. There's a lot of infrastructure building, a lot of chips, things like that, and some of these short term gains. But in particular, progressives want it to be recognized that we still have remarkable inequality. We still have some people for whom inflation is, is, uh, is, is hard to control. How do you message that? What is the message right now that, that, that what is Biden doing that's good and what is it you tell people who are dissatisfied with, with him? And I'm not talking about the critics who just carry on about uh, Biden's failed economy. I'm talking about real people who say this is an, still an unequal society. Well, you say, yes, it is an unequal society, and Joe Biden is the first president in years, in fact, uh, arguably the first president since Franklin D. Roosevelt, who has really taken on the structure of the economy in terms of using antitrust law to break up some of the biggest monopolies, uh, making the labor laws really work for people, making it easier for workers uh, to 
organized unions, uh, increasing the number of people who get time and a half overtime. And we could go through the list. And it's also creating a lot of new manufacturing jobs. You know, the CHIPS Act and the uh, the other major investments that uh, Joe Biden has made really are very much about building the middle class in this country. It's going to take time. This is not something that can be done overnight. And it's not going to be very persuasive to people that are cynical about the economy and feel that they're not getting ahead to say, oh, you're doing very, very well. That doesn't work. Uh, you've got to say, well, here is the direction the economy is taking under Joe Biden. Here is why Biden is doing it. And here is why you are and your children are going to be much better off in the years ahead. I'm going to leave it at that, because anything else I say is only going to spoil uh, that very articulate message. Bob, good to see you, as always. Thank you very much. Rob, Robert Reich uh, joining us tonight. Tonight's last word is next. This Sunday in Atlanta, President Biden will deliver the commencement address at Morehouse College, an historically black college that counts the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as one of its graduates. Ahead of the speech, President Biden spoke to an Atlanta radio station yesterday about what his administration has done for black Georgia residents. We created 15 million new jobs. We built black wealth back up. Black wealth was up 60% since the pandemic. Black home ownership is up. I'm fighting back against racial bias and home appraisal. Nearly 1 million new business applications in Georgia after investing hundreds of millions of dollars in small businesses in the state. Mm -hmm. Saved 76,000 black homeowners, more than 800 bucks a month. I promised to relieve student debt, and I did. $160 billion in student loan debt uh, and nearly 4.6 million borrowers, including many black borrowers in Georgia. President Biden will return to Atlanta on June 27th to debate former President Donald Trump for the first debate of the 2024 presidential campaign. In the 2020 election, President Biden won Georgia by fewer than 12,000 votes. A new MSNBC film debuting this Sunday tells the story of how Democrats turned Georgia blue in 2020, overcoming a history of voter suppression to do it. Grassroots organizers have played an enormous role in getting Georgia to a rate of 95 percent of all age-eligible Georgians registered to vote. 95 percent. What kind of letter did you get? It said, uh, I suppose, the unregistered in Ohio. Are you registered in Ohio? I don't live there. I was three years ago. Well, they're doing a list maintenance, and I want to make sure you were not taken off the right, rolls right. here. I'm inspired of the resolve that I see with people waiting hours for two and three hours. And there's something about people really being grounded in a form of resistance. We know, yeah, we should be out here waiting. And yes, there are a whole lot of things that I probably need to do with these hours. But right now, I'm going to stand in this space. Former Vice President Joe Biden has been elected President of the United States. The people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory. We were not surprised by the election. We were not surprised by the results. We're not surprised that Georgia is at the center of the universe and flipping this whole country. NGP! Because a number of us have done the work and built the base that made it possible. You can watch Battleground Georgia Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC. I'll see you tomorrow morning on Velshi. If you're in the Chicago area, I might see you in person. I'll be at the Chicago Humanities Festival tomorrow, along with my friend and colleague Jen Saki. I'll be at Illinois Tech's Herman Hall at 3 p.m. for a conversation about the responsibilities of citizenship and social justice and my new book, Small Acts of Courage. For tickets, go to chicagohumanities.org. Hope to see you tomorrow.